So tonight uh, we have an opportunity uh, to hear from, from Jonathan. Jonathan, you can make your way up. Um, you know, I, I've said before, we're not a big group of people, but we tend, we somehow become a group of people with a whole lot of preachers. Um, and it has been so good to hear from some of them, and will be so good to hear from more of them um, as the as the months uh, go by. And uh, Jonathan, I had wanted Jonathan to preach a couple of months ago because it's been a little while. Um, but um, you know, baby Micah made his appearance, uh, his entrance, and, and Jonathan thought that he could probably use a little more time to get ready. Um, so tonight we have the uh, the blessing. Uh, Micah gets to hear Dad preach for the first time. <laughs> And, uh, and we get to hear um, everything that God has put in Jonathan's heart. So, Jonathan, thank you, brother. Um, let the Spirit have his way. Good evening, guys. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Um, so, thank you for that. Uh, first and foremost, I want to, on behalf of Amber and myself, I want to thank you guys uh, for your prayers and support and encouragement for... Um, especially the, the, the past eight weeks, um, but even before that, uh, you know, with the birth of our son, like God. <laughs> and uh, it still feels a bit weird to say, we got, finally got a social security card. Mm -hmm. I saw his name and I was like, oh, this is so weird. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we really, really, really appreciate everything that you guys have done for us. Um, and everything that you guys are still doing uh, for us, you know, uh, the prayers, the encouragement, the tips, uh, the strategies, you know, everything. So we, we really appreciate everything that you guys are doing. So I, 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 wanted, I wanted to make sure uh, that we use this opportunity to, um, to express our gratitude uh, for everything that you guys have done, to, uh, to express my gratitude publicly. So thank you guys, we really, 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 really appreciate it. Um, we thank God for you guys, and uh, thank you for, as David taught uh, a few weeks ago, uh, being the provision and, and, and showing, showing how that actually works. So, related to that, um, you know, one of the reasons why we named our son Micah, it's supposed like the name, uh, but it's because of one of our favorite verses which is Micah 6, chapter 8. Micah chapter 6, verses 8, uh, which reads, He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you, but to do justice, and to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. But in addition to that, another reason why we chose that name, Micah, is because of its meaning. The literal meaning for Micah is who is like the Lord, or more literally, who is like Yahweh. And in chapter 7 of the book of Micah, he uses a play of words, using his name to begin the last section of the book. And it goes, and it says, reads, and it reads, Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever, because he delights in steadfast love. He will again have compassion on us. He will tread our iniquities underfoot. You will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. You will show steadfast, you will show faithfulness to Jacob and steadfast love to Abraham, as you have sworn to our fathers from the days of old. That's Micah chapter 7. Verses 18 and 20. 18 to 20. See, the, 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 the meaning of the name and, uh, not only uh, invokes a description of who God is, but also what his desire is. Amen. Right? It says he, he, he delights in steadfast love, he delights in having compassion, he delights in treading our iniquities underfoot. He delights in casting our sins into the depths of the sea. He delights to show faithfulness. Right? It's what his desire has always been. 
the ministry of reconciliation has always been God's desire. You know, um, Aiden last week mentioned the, the building bridges to prayer that's on the website, and I, I think that's such a, a, a beautiful phrase, a beautiful way to phrase the ministry of reconciliation. And two weeks ago, Aiden talked about God, that, that being God's greatest desire, right? His, his greatest desire is Him being glorified by men being redeemed, right? Salvation, redemption, as, as PJ opened us up with, right? And he was talking about that, Amy, at least, was talking about that in the context of prayer. But I want to talk about that uh, in the context of our conversations and our lives among what's going on around us in society today. So just to put it plainly, there is a lot of confusion that is happening in our culture today. Right, you look around and you will find that any and everything is up for debate. You look around and you can hardly find a matter of uh, topic, a matter of discussion that you'll find a, a, a most people to agree with. And what's being modeled by the culture is that you're either on one side or the other. And none of these sides, emphasis on none of these <laughs> sides, have any regard to the ways of God. They have no regard or very little to the authority of Scripture or to the Lordship of Jesus. In fact, much of what we see in the culture is either a complete rejection of the way of God or a complete redefining or reshaping of God's word to suit whatever worldly goals and desire they have, not the heart of the Lord. Now, to keep this in proper context, we have to realize this is nothing new. This has always been the case. All throughout human history, this has been the case. But even so, today, it can be tempting to see everything through the lens of us versus them. And while there is a real sense of there being a battle of light versus darkness, we must not make the mistake of conflating that with a us versus them mindset. Okay? It is written, we all know the verse in, in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. You know, we can talk about the multiple ways that the culture is rebelling against God. The, 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 list, the list is near endless. And there is a place for that, but here's, one, here's where I want to keep as our focus today, today. And I believe this is vital. Are our conversations about those we disagree with salvation focused or fear based? Are our conversations, are our commentaries, our pushbacks, are they born out of love and redemption because that is the heart of God? Or are they born out of our expectation and whether they are met or not? Are our lives as believers centered around reconciliation to God or just countering the narratives of the culture that is propagated by the enemies of God? Too many times for me, just to be frank, it's the latter. And I know that some of you guys can relate. And that's dangerous. Because being solely focused on countering the enemies of God only helps to blind us to what God is doing around us. Or more specifically, it will blind us to the fact that God works to save his enemies. It reminds me of the account of the crowd's reaction to Jesus going into Zacchaeus' house. house. 
Zacchaeus, the, the, the chief tax collector, who like all tax collectors at that time were seen as traitors, who were seen as robbers, who were considered those that sold out to Rome. You know, in, in Luke chapter 9, 19, verses 3 to 7, it says, this is the account of, of Zacchaeus meeting Jesus. And he, that is Zacchaeus, was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not, because he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into the sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they being a the crowd, they all grumbled. He has gone in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner, is what they said. So here on one hand we see Jesus going where the Father led him, which is to the house of a hated tax collector, and bringing with him salvation, yeah. redemption. And on the other hand we see the crowd grumbling, complaining. Grumbling because their expectations of Jesus were not being met. Complaining because they expected Jesus to abhor Zacchaeus the same way they did. Right. They expected God to hate Zacchaeus the way they did. Right. The last thing they wanted for Zacchaeus was reconciliation with God. Amen. All the while being blind to the fact that Jesus was doing for Zacchaeus what he was also doing for them giving them a more accurate picture of who God is and his desire. He was also bringing to Zacchaeus his salvation, the same thing that he was bringing for them. Amen. And they missed it. Are we of the mindset of Jesus? Or have we fallen into the trap of having the mindset of the crowd? This is why Jesus said to Zacchaeus, and I believe he was saying this to the crowd and to us whenever we are acting like the crowd. Today, salvation has come to this house since he is also a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek who? The lost. He came to seek and save the lost. The father sent Jesus to turn the enemies of God into the children Amen. of God. Amen. That's the heart of God. Yes. So doesn't that mean we should also have a heart for the enemies of God? Amen. Doesn't that mean we should also have a heart for the lost? Amen. Is that not the beginning, really the prerequisite of the ministry of reconciliation? Yeah. Yeah. He came to bring the dead to life. Have we lost that? Have we lost sight of that desire of God? <coughs> Honestly, I believe for too many of us, we have. We have lost it. We have lost, that, we have lost sight of it. Too many of us have a Zacchaeus in our life. Whether we know them personally or not, too many of us have people that come to mind and we think that they are far too God for an encounter with God. Some of you are of the older generation, so you might be familiar with the old hymn, Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Right? Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. You guys remember that hymn? Yeah. Okay. I, I grew up in a old school church that signed that hymn yeah. a lot of times. <laughs> you know, if it was up to some of us, if we had our way for the Zacchaeus in our lives, we'd sing, pass on by, O gentle Savior. 
Don't waste your time on that one. Pass on by, oh Jesus. That person is too far gone. Or that person doesn't deserve your presence. As if any of us deserve his presence. You know, Amy mentioned, he mentioned it last week, and I think this, 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 it bears repeating, and it bears emphasizing, that the way we speak about people changes the way we pray for them. And vice versa, the way we pray for people will change the way we speak about them. You know, that's, that's one of the reasons why I believe the apostles Paul and Peter can each write in their respective letters to respect the governing authorities while being persecuted by those governing authorities. Right? Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 17, to honor everyone, love the brotherhood, yeah. fear God, and honor the emperor. You know, the emperor during the time that Peter wrote this, do you know who that was? That was Emperor Nero. Okay, if you have time, look up who he was. Okay, to put it mildly, he was no friend of the first century church. Okay, in fact, because of the many wicked and evil things he did, many of the early church thought he was the Antichrist. But here Peter, in his letter, wrote to the believers to honor him. Obviously, he's not writing for them to agree with him. But we know that there's a way you can honor and disagree at the same time. Right? Paul wrote to Titus, remind them, that is the believers, to be subject to rulers, to authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good deed, to malign no one. To be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. That's, Peter, that's Titus chapter 3 verse 1. How far have we fallen from that? What is a church that has lost the Lord's heart for the lost? For one thing, to lose a heart for the lost is to lose sight of God's heart. Plain and simple. To lose a heart for the lost is to, is to be no different than those who miss the Son of God in their midst. Or even worse, to be like those who actively oppose the work of God in their midst. Remember it was... Those of the same heart who said to the Son of God and of the Son of God who was moved and was filled by the power of the Holy Spirit that he was working by the power of Satan. Can you imagine that? The most holiest man to ever step foot on earth. Because they weren't meeting their expectations, they said he was working in the power of Satan. The one filled with the Holy Spirit, the Son of God. How, how, how deceived is that? We're not immune from that. We're not immune from that at all. To lose the Lord's heart for the lost is to completely lose who God is. It is to completely miss the will of God for us and for those around us. It is to take on a sense of haughtiness, a false sense of superiority. It's to forget where we came from. We were once enemies of God. Right? That is what we see from the Pharisees in the scriptures. And that is why they wanted nothing to do with sinners and questioned Jesus every time he went to associate with, with sinners. They forgot the heart of God. They missed his will, and we are in danger of doing that too if we forget the heart of God. You know, but as Paul wrote in Titus chapter 3, verse 2 through 5, for we also once were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, 
spending our life in malice and envy, hateful, hating one another. But when the kindness of God our Savior and His love for mankind appeared, He saved us. Amen. Not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to His mercy. Yes. Yes. He delights in mercy. Yes. So it is, com it, is to, it is to completely miss what the Lord has said about Himself, mm. not to have the heart of for the lost. Mm. You're missing what He said about Himself. Mm. How many times in Scripture has God described Himself or or is God described as being merciful and gracious? Again, the, the name Micah means who is Yahweh. And the answer that the prophet Micah gave is the same answer that the other prophets gave, yeah. even in the midst of judgment. Yeah. It's the same answer the psalmist gave. It's the same answer that God gives about himself. In Exodus chapter 34, verses 6, when the Lord passed before Moses, what did he proclaim? The Lord, the Lord of God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. In Jeremiah chapter 9, verses 23 and 24, the prophet wrote, Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom, let not the mighty man boast in his might, let not the rich man boast in his riches, but let him who boasts boast in this, that he understands and knows me. I am the Lord who practices steadfast love, Amen. justice and righteousness. Justice, justice and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, I delight. Right on cue. <laughs> Psalms, chapter 100, verses 5. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Amen. Psalms 86, verse 5. For you, Lord, are good, you are ready to forgive, and abundant in loving kindness to all who call upon you. He stands poised to forgive. That's the picture that, that's, in my, that's in my mind when I read that verse. He's ready to forgive. Over and over and over, all throughout scripture we see the mercy of God, the love of God, the graciousness of God. We see repeated calls to turn to him from Genesis to Revelation. We see the ministry of reconciliation led, first and foremost, by God himself. Mm. Can we say we see that in the church today? Mm. Or have we been caught up? Are we like the crowd who grumbled at Jesus when he went to save Zacchaeus? Or are we like the Pharisee who Jesus spoke of in Luke 18? You guys remember that? Yeah. Two men walk, walk, went into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee standing by himself praying, Thus God, I thank you that I am not like that other man. I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like the tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all I get. But the tax collector standing far off would not even lift his eyes to heaven but beat his breast saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus say of him? I tell you, this man went down to his house justified. Yeah. Rather than the other. Yeah. Why? The other was looking to himself. Mm -hmm. He's basically saying, God, you owe me. This is, this, is, this is my do. I do this. I do that. Not, not, not like them. No. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Yeah. And the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Yeah. Again, as Jesus said in Luke 5, when 
Again, he was asked why he was eating with sinners. He said, it is not for those who are well who need a doctor, mm -hmm. but for those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Yeah. So you may be sick, you may look around in the culture today and you, the, stuff, the things you say might upset you. And to be honest, they upset me, just to keep it right. Yeah. Many of it, I am convinced, is of the evil one. Yes. Straight up. Yeah. Many of it is born out of selfish gain and lust for power. Yeah. We live in a culture that has blinded their eyes to truth and replaced it with all manner of confusion. Some of that confusion is deceitfully done in the name of justice and love and compassion yeah. when it is nothing but the opposite exactly. of those things. True. There is no short list of things to criticize and to condemn as evil and wicked, but as we do, are we broken hearted for what's happening? Jesus wept over Jerusalem, right. the city who killed the prophets, mm -hmm. the city that he knew would condemn him to the cross. He wept. He wept mm -hmm. because of what they were rejecting. He wept because of what they were missing. Mm -hmm. Are we weeping for this country? Are we weeping over this country's rejection of God? A lot of us is not, we're not weeping. We're condemning yeah. both sides. Yeah. We're not weeping. That's not the heart of God. Yeah. Yeah. Leonard Ravenhill said, the world has lost the power to blush over its vice and the church have lost her power to weep over it. Is that true? There's a lot of truth to that. You know, we, gotta, we, we have to make sure we have the heart of the Father. You know, I was looking I was trying to weave the, the, the parable of the prodigal son in here because I think it fits. And I think most of us are very familiar with it, right? The, the, the younger of the, bro of the brothers said to his father to give, give him the share that falls to him. And the father did. And he takes his share and he goes to a distant country and he blows it. He squanders his estate. But then when he comes to his senses, he said, I will go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight I am no longer to be called your son. Make me as one of your servants. And what does it say of the father? But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion for him and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. And the father said to his servants, bring out the breast robe, Amen. put it on him, yeah. put a ring on his hand, put sandals on his feet, kill the fatted calf, kill it. Let us eat and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and has come to life again. He was lost, and he has been found. Yeah. And they began to celebrate. Because if you read Luke chapter 15, twice, in the two sections before this, twice he gives a picture of what happens in heaven when a sinner Amen. repents. Amen. This is what happens. Amen. Heaven celebrates. Because the Father celebrates. Right? Right? They began to celebrate, and the older son was in the field. And when he came and approached the house, he heard the music and the dancing. He asked what happened. They told him his brother has come. The father has killed the fatted calf because he received him back. He's safe and sound, and he became.
became angry and was not willing to go in. And his father came out and began pleading with him. But he answered the father, the father, he answered his father and said, look, the father uh, answered him and said, look, we had to celebrate and rejoice for this brother of yours was dead and have begun to live. He was lost and have been found. And this is the picture that we should keep in our minds when we, when we see ungodliness. You know, that's the picture that we should keep in our head whenever we're criticizing politicians or whatnot. They're dead. Yeah. They need life. Yeah. They need to know the author of life. Yes. Yes. Whenever we see celebrities messing up, when the people in our lives who don't know God are saying all manner of, of confusion and evil things, they're dead. Yeah. They need life. Like the prodigal son who squandered his inheritance, there are many who are being deceived right now by the lies yeah. of this world. Yeah. And the Lord, the Lord is working to have them come to their senses as we speak. Amen. Amen. As great as the darkness is today, as great as the deception is today, as great as the outright rebellion against God is today here in this culture, how much greater should all prayers be that encounters with our merciful God happen? How much more so, how much more so should we be praying for reconciliation? That's the heart of the Father. We must have the heart of the good and waiting father who had compassion on his returning son rather than that of the older brother who didn't understand the heart of the father. The prodigals are coming. And we need to be ready for them Amen. with open arms. Amen. The prodigals are coming. Yes. What? What if in the same parable, I'll take a little liberty with that parable. Mm -hmm. What if the father wasn't at the house? You know, he left for a while and he left his message of reconciliation to the older son. Mm -hmm. And the prodigal comes home and the oldest son, rather than embrace his returning brother, rather than prepare a feast, for him, rather than relay the message of reconciliation, says your sins are too great, younger brother. There's no place for you here. The prodigal would have a completely wrong idea of the father's heart for him. And dejected, he would have no clue how much the father loves him and waited for him. What would happen when the father returns and the servants tell him his message of reconciliation was never relayed? And in fact, a message of condemnation was poured out instead. We have to have the heart of the father. So you see, we're like the prodigal son who turns away, no, we're like the older son who turns away the returning prodigal if we don't have the heart of the Father. So, too many of us are poised like that. Yeah. We've been caught up in the ways of the world. We've been caught up in the wave of this age. Us versus them. we got to step out of that. Yeah. We have to. You know, we have to have the heart of the Father or we will end up building walls where God would have us build gates. We have to keep our eyes on the character of God. We have to pay attention to what Jesus says of the Father and of himself. Having a heart for the Father looks like Jesus healing Malchus's ear after his own disciple Peter cut it off with a sword as he was being arrested by Malchus and the others who came to arrest him. Having the heart of the Father looks like Jesus while on the cross praying 
to his Father in heaven that he would forgive the very people who crucified him. Yeah. And what did he pray? Lord, forgive them. What did he pray? Having the heart of the Father looks like Stephen prayed for the men who were actively in the process of killing him. And what did he pray? Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Yes. What? Yeah. <laughs> think, think about the gravity of that prayer. Think how against our nature that prayer is. They're killing him and he's praying for them. Someone writes a mean post about us. <laughs> and we block them. We're done. The prayer of our nature, or the prayer of our culture, would be God, don't allow, don't allow them to harm me. Or God, may this be returned to them ten times fold. Or, touch not the Lord's anointed. That's our prayer. The kingdom minded prayer, the prayer with the Father's desire at the center of it, says, save them. Yes. Do not lay this to their account. Why? Because he wills that none would perish. He wills that none would perish. None. Not Trump, not Biden, nobody. None. Do not lay this to their account. Mm. That's why there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than the 99 righteous persons who need none, who need no repentance, because that's the heart of the Father. Mm. And back to that prayer of Stephen. Remember who was in the crowd? Given a hearty approval Amen. to his death, Amen. it was Saul. Yeah. So, in a real sense, yeah. Saul yes. became the apostle Paul yes. as a result of that prayer. Amen. 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 In a real sense. Yes. Talk about building bridges through prayer. Amen. Amen. Right? And in a real sense, we are all in the faith as a result of that prayer. Yes. Because Paul was the apostle to the who? The Gentiles. Yes. Most of us in here are Gentiles. Yes. Again, talk about building bridges through prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He built a bridge that transcend time, Hallelujah. countries, generations. Having a heart for the Father looks like the Apostle Paul wanted salvation for his Jewish brethren so much so that he would have traded his own salvation to ensure it for his brethren, if he could. Do we have anything close to that today? Do we have any Democrats praying for Republicans to be saved that would forfeit their salvation to ensure it? If they could, and vice versa. Hallelujah. We gotta stop playing around, man. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not saying this because I am free from that temptation. Alright? I'm tempted to join that back and forth too. But that's not the heart of God. Hallelujah. Do we have anything close to that heart today? If the answer is no, which unfortunately is the case for a lot of us, then we need to re-examine our hearts. Yeah. And we need to realign our hearts with the fathers. Yeah. We, need to, we need a recalibration. Yeah. We need to remember where we came from. Yeah. We need to remember that, again, we were enemies of God. We were sons of disobedience. 
We were by nature objects of his wrath, rightfully so. But God, but God, who went from enemies to his children, to his friends, to those who are invited in, He's poised to forgive anyone, all who calls on him. Amen. We need to remember where we came from. We need to remember the gravity of the gift that is given to us, the gift of redemption, the gift of salvation, the gift of reconciliation yes. to God and to each other. Yes. Remember the gravity of that gift so much so that it becomes a priority that those around us receive that same gift Amen. if they don't have it. Amen. Because without this, there is no ministry of reconciliation. And that's just a rejection of God's heart. You know, um, I'll finish with uh, reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 to 20. And it reads, all this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. There goes that phrase again. not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. Therefore, if you are entrusted with the message of reconciliation, you're an ambassador of Christ. That's the same message that he was entrusted with by God the Father. Right? God making his appeal through us. Are we making the appeal if we're caught up in the ways of the world? In the me versus you, in the us versus them. Are we making an appeal? The appeal gets drowned out. Because you're over there. And I'm over here. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. No, we rather say, no, be reconciled to my point of view. Mm -hmm. you got, do we see the difference? Yes. Yes. You know, I was talk, we were talking about this, uh, Amber and I, and, you know, we were talking about how for the last few weeks, uh, we've been talking about how prayer, as Amy has been teaching, prayer is us joining the conversation of the Godhead. And you know, Amber and I came to the conclusion that we don't believe it's possible to be a part of that conversation and not want to join the mission of the Godhead. Amen. Which is the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. So do you have any Zacchaeus in your life? I know I do. I'm going to be uh, very vulnerable right now. And I'll, I'll, I'll end it with that. Last, this week actually, makes 11 years since my younger brother was killed. He was killed by gun violence. The guy who killed him is still free. Never paid for it. Talk about rough, right? Mm -hmm. Every year, this week, you could imagine a flood of emotion comes in. Mm -hmm. Right? Sometimes, some, sometimes are better than others. The heart of the Father told, tells me to pray for his salvation. Amen. 
You know, my mom prayed for his salvation. My mom told him to his face, she forgives him. You know what she did? You know what he did? He called the police on her. That's the heart of a father. Though. She still prayed for him. You have a Zacchaeus in your life? I have one, I have one other Zacchaeus. You know, because that's related to the first Zacchaeus. Because my brother was killed by another black guy, it eats me up inside just to be really frank. When I see people protest the deaths of black people by police officers and are nowhere to be found when they're killed by other black people, it eats me and drives me insane because that's not justice. All right, that's preference. And a lot of it is done for political purposes. That's another Zacchaeus of mine. Because what does the heart of the Father say? Yeah. Pray for them. Yes. Hold it not to their account. Yes. I wonder if all of us pray for our Zacchaeuses, how many bridges would be built? How many bridges that transcend time and generations will be built? We were singing the song, Is He Worthy? Is He Worthy? Is He Worthy of me giving up my feelings of whatever, right? Is He worthy of that? It's very tempting to say no, but we all know that's a lie from Satan himself. Amen. Is there Zacchaeus in your life? We should have been Zacchaeus to God, yeah. and he came and saved us, yeah. and made us his own. Mm -hmm. The Ministry of Reconciliation. Yeah. <clears throat> so, I'd like to end with a prayer, right? Amen. Yeah. Thank you. Lord, thank you for the ministry of reconciliation. Thank you that you never asked us to do what you're not willing to do. Amen. And you were more than willing to come and reconcile us to yourself. Thank you. So Lord, help us to reconcile others to you. Yes. Help us to pray for those who we really don't want to pray for. For your sake. Yes, for your glory. Yes, because you desire it. Mm -hmm. Lord, I pray that you would use this. Anything that's not of you, throw it away. Anything that is of you, use to grow us. Yes. Use to shape us and conform us yes. more to the image of your son. Yes. Save souls, Lord. Yes. Those who are the Zacchaeus of our lives, save them. Yes. Those who we can't stand to be around, save them. Yes. Those who we can't stand to see on television, save them. Yes, Those who disagree with us, save them. Yes, God. Save them for your glory. Yes, God. Lord. Yes, God. Bring them to yourselves. And Lord, I pray that you would, I pray that you would remind your body especially here in America, especially here in the, in the West, but all over, of the ministry of reconciliation, the weightiness of it, the weightiness of the gift that we have, and your longing to include more. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for redemption. Yes. May we not hoard it to ourselves. I pray these things in the matchless name of the risen Christ. Amen. 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 Thanks, Jonathan. Um, thank you guys for being here tonight. If you need prayer, if you want to spend some time praying, please uh, just stay here. And um, if you would just take this one thing with you tonight, um, 
Psalm 85. Right? He, is, he is ready to forgive. Amen. He didn't decide to forgive when he saw the son. Yeah. Something happened in the son's heart because the father was always ready to forgive. So as you pray this week, and, and you know what, Jonathan and I didn't talk about it, but he did a great job of preparing you for what I'm going to preach next week. <laughs> forgive, forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who trespass against us. Would you just ask him to show you the depth of his readiness to forgive? Every time this week you get offended, you get angry, you get upset, you disagree, Ask the Holy Spirit to just whisper one thing to your heart. I am ready to forgive. Because what that means, his readiness means everything we see happen is God leading to forgiveness. Everything he does. Because what led the younger son home? A famine reminded him of his father's heart. And so I'll finish with this. What if a pandemic is doing nothing more than reminding the world of the heart of their father. What if earthquakes and tornadoes and warming of, uh, of the planet and everything we are trying our hardest to fight is God saying, I'm ready to forgive. Let's stop trying to change what God's doing and join with the heart of who God is. He is ready to forgive. Thank you, Jonathan. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Have a great week again. If you'd like to prayer, please grab somebody before you leave. And we will see you Wednesday night for Bible study, and we will see you back here next Saturday night. God bless you guys. Thank you.